For several years, I've been very interested in Zimbabwe because Robert Mugabe is pretty much the only African leader trying to totally dislodge white power in Africa. A little history lesson on Zimbabwe. White supremacy came to Zimbabwe starting with the genocidal lunatic Cecil Rhodes. The country was then renamed Rhodesia. As usual, white power attempting to erase a people by trying to rename them, since names link us to a specific time, place, and culture. About the only thing that remains of Cecil Rhodes today is the so-called Rhodes Scholarship. Many presidents and so-called white liberals have gotten it and are proud of it. The Zimbabwean people did to Cecil Rhodes what all Africans do. They fought him until they won. But, as so often happened, after the Europeans lost power, they may have lost the war, but they won the peace. In Uganda, the British installed Idi Amin to be their puppet and protect their interests, which he did, until he eventually became more willful than they were willing to allow. He tossed out the Asians and denounced the whites. They've claimed, with hardly any evidence, that he murdered thousands, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions. Of course, not a single word of this is true, but it's been repeated so often that people have bought into it. In Kenya, the Brits had no problem letting their hand-picked puppet, Daniel Moy, run things for over 20 years. And when the people eventually barred him from running again, he passed the torch, or rather the knife, to yet another white stooge, Moai Kabaki. I don't think I have to tell you that South Africa's first black president was himself hand-picked by the very whites whom his so-called Truth Commission has arbitrarily decided to exempt from any and all prosecutions. Anyway, Robert Mugabe was a good little white boy for a while, doing as he was told, securing and protecting white interests. He killed anyone who threatened his rule, and the Brits had no problem with it. After all, he didn't touch the land they had stolen, nor was he interfering with their stealing Zimbabwe's minerals. They loved Mugabe, back then. Ah, but they're singing a different song now. To hear the good white folks tell the story today, they sound like the police chief in the movie Casablanca, simply shocked to learn that Mugabe had committed ghastly acts of violence against people back when they were giving him praise and adulation. Uh, the knighthood. Um... Foreign Secretary, do you believe he should be stripped of his knighthood? Well, I was horrified to find out that Robert Mugabe uh, had a knighthood. You didn't know? I, I was, no, I didn't know that he was uh, Robert Mugabe. You became Foreign Secretary without knowing that. The, 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 the important... Just on the knighthood, um, Douglas heard you were Foreign Secretary when he was given the knighthood, I think. I think not. <laughs> you I were in the government when he was given the knighthood. Uh, 94, what were you in 94? I was, I was Foreign Secretary That was when he was given his knighthood. But not, but not, not by the, not by the, well I must plead uh, total amnesia, not by me and not I think by the British government, but I'm and Who else sure. can give him a knighthood except the British government? It's Casey. I don't, I simply do not know the answer to that, but what, what whatever, I, what, I was going to raise was that he was known when he got that knighthood, whoever gave it to him, the British government or I don't think of any other government no. that could give it to him. It was known yeah. already by then that he had massacred 20,000 people in Matabeleland with we, North we, Korean trained armies in the 80s. Why hosted, was he ever given a He knight? hosted a, a, um, a Commonwealth conference, and conceivably it might have been in recognition of that. The Queen went there. He, he, he was, I don't say in good standing, but he was a member of the Commonwealth alongside a, a lot of other people. Of course you did. That's right. Robert Mugabe is actually Sir Robert Mugabe, a knight of the British Empire. So, if Mugabe was a loyal wannabe white boy, what changed? Under immense pressure from the African people, he eventually became dissatisfied with being the white's lackey and decided to start taking back his people's land. This is where the British and the Americans declared war on him. The main cheerleaders against Mugabe has been the BBC, the British news outlet through whom the world has gotten its news about Zimbabwe for the last 30 years. They've accused him of everything but the Jewish Holocaust. Until Mugabe started reclaiming the land, that same BBC wrote nothing but glowing reports about him for over 25 years. But the instant he started taking back the land, they've had nothing but scorn.
In order to make it clear how evil Mugabe is, the white media decided to manufacture a hero in their little drama. They chose the MDC, the so-called Movement for Democratic Change. The MDC was started in the late 1990s, back when Mugabe was still carrying water for the whites. The MDC didn't want whites out of power. They just wanted the money the whites had been giving to Mugabe to be given to them instead. The whites at first ignored the MDC, and the MDC couldn't get their candidates elected dog catcher. They had no money and no media support. But when Mugabe started reclaiming the land for his people, all of a sudden the whites started pumping cash into the MDC like crazy. The BBC decided these guys would be presented to the world as heroes fighting against an evil dictator. Of course, they never tell anyone that the only thing the MDC is fighting for is for whites to keep the land they've stolen. No economic policy, no agricultural policy, no educational policies. The MDC's entire political platform can be summed up in seven words. Don't touch the land the whites stole. Mugabe is called a racist, but the BBC never once has shown the world just who the men who run the MDC are. Men like Ian Kay, a domestic terrorist charged with numerous counts of inciting violence. And this guy is a member of the MDC and is now a Zimbabwean parliamentarian. In a country where whites are only 1% of the population, how is it possible that this guy can be a member of the parliament? because he's one of the racist white thugs who was running the place during colonialism. He's used the money he stole to engineer a place for himself in the government of a country he shouldn't even be in. Idiots like Morgan Charangi are only puppets. It's bastards like Kay who actually run the MDC. Charangi does what they say. But back to the whites' PR war against Mugabe last year. Realizing they couldn't pull in a rock and gin up a quickie excuse to invade, because everyone would recognize it as recolonization, the whites in London decided to take out sanctions instead. And when that didn't work, they asked the U.S. to do the same. The president at that time, W, gladly obliged. Pay attention, because what comes next is crucially important. The U.S.'s very first move was to freeze credit against Zimbabwe. I'm sure you've heard the term credit freeze the last 10 months. It's a credit freeze by the World Banks that has brought the U.S. to its knees, destroyed the housing market, and caused a global economic catastrophe. I highlight that so you can understand how important credit is to a national economy, even the U.S.'s. The U.S. still has working farms, working factories, and a service sector, but credit alone has caused nearly 10% unemployment in only a few months. This is what the Brits and Americans did to a country with nowhere near the financial resilience of the United States. This was when Zimbabwe's economic trouble started, not during the land reclamation. Neither the BBC nor any other part of the white media has told this story but you're about to hear it now. They instead talk about Zimbabwe's economic woes, and they always, always talk about the whites being forced off the land they stole. Check it out for yourself. Whenever Zimbabwe is mentioned, without exception, the article or news broadcast will talk about supersonic inflation and then immediately talk about the poor downtrodden whites who the mean old Mugabe is pushing off the land. This is done in order to create a false association in your mind between Zimbabwe's economic problems and whites being evicted from the land they stole. Even though Zimbabwe's problems are not at all related to the land reclamation program, rather the freezing of credit, financial assistance, and assets carried out by the U.S. on the behalf of Britain. They also keep talking about the farms. Like the whites are just Farmer Joe working to feed the Africans, Let's get one thing straight. The Africans were no better off food-wise before Mugabe started taking the land back. The main people who benefited from the white so-called farmers in Zimbabwe were the whites in South Africa. The Africans have never had full bellies off of whites owning the farmland. But that's the way propaganda works. They want you to think that reclaiming the land has caused massive starvation, 
when it hasn't. The sanctions have hurt Zimbabwe, not land reclamation. And the BBC is not a neutral observer in all this. They are a zealous advocate for the whites. As far as the BBC is concerned, hey, we stole that land fair and square. Now, how is it that they can get away with these lies? Because we, as black people, do not ask about it. This is why the white media will do interviews with the bootlicks in the MDC, but nobody thinks it strange that not one member of Mugabe's government has been interviewed. In fact, W took out sanctions against Mugabe more strident than anything he ever did against Iran or Iraq. Neither Mugabe nor any member of his government or anyone seeking to advocate on their behalf financially can enter the U.S. Think about that. Ahmadinejad went to Columbia University and gave a lecture, even though he took Americans hostage in the 1970s. Say, isn't he supposed to be on the no-fly list? The U.S. has removed sanctions against Libya and normalized relations with that country, even though Gaddafi was responsible for the deaths of Americans, the destruction of U.S. airplanes, and numerous acts of terror against the U.S., for which he has neither been punished nor so much as apologized. But Robert Mugabe, who has not committed an act of terror against the U.S., not supported anyone who has, has not even spoken in defense of anyone who has committed terror against the U.S., has sanctions put on him. So why is he on a terror watch list? Why can't he enter the United States? When Mugabe won the last election, the whites realized he was going to finally go ahead and toss them all out. That's why we saw the fake outrage from them last year. They tried to go to the African Union, figuring that because they had created the African Union and had most of its members on strings, that it would be a simple matter to get the poor Africans to denounce Mugabe. And after that, they would get the Africans to authorize the Brits to send in the Marines. Of course, it didn't happen that way. The AU rejected what was an obvious attempt at recolonization. So, the whites went running to the UN instead, figuring they would get their way there. But Mugabe had already shored up his political support on the UN through the alliances he built with China, who, as a permanent member of the UN Security Council, has veto power. And Russia also joined China in vetoing the Brits' plan to move forward with military action against Mugabe. The whites howled and screamed about it. How corrupt the UN is! Because one vote is all it takes to derail the whites' well-laid plans. But those same whites have no problem when the U.S. is the only Security Council member to vote against condemning Israel for its violence against the Palestinians, or when the U.S. votes against a resolution condemning racism. Zimbabwe is a small, poor, weak country. But even so, Mugabe has outfought and outthought the Euro clowns every step of the way. It just goes to show, anyone who says you can't beat the whites at their own game never tried. This is why the white media can't get enough of hating the man. To them, he's like O.J. Simpson times a million. Every day they see him, they have to look at a black man who has shown the world that whites can be kicked around, punched around, beat around, thrown off the land they stole, forced to give back the money they robbed the world of, and that if the non-white world bands together, even the U.S. can't do a damn thing about it. It is the single most dangerous example of defiance toward white power that the modern world has ever seen. But most blacks don't even know that it happened. What happened to Africa under white rule was the same thing you see today. A relentless PR war to convince the world the Africans were primitive savages and they'd be better off with whites in charge. They can't force the issue, so they need to use the last bastion of white power, the media, to fool people into coming to that conclusion on their own. This is why they cannot allow Mugabe's people into the country, why no reporters will talk to him, and why they must demonize him day and night. Mugabe represents the greatest threat to white power the world has ever seen in the modern age. He's no Nelson Mandela, no stooge. He's a man, a black man, standing on his own two feet. No, I don't forgive the thousands of lives Mugabe took, but as it stands, he is fighting for the right thing now. I wouldn't build him any monuments, nor would I praise him. 
But it's not Mugabe I care about. It's Africa. So I support what he's doing. Because it's way past time somebody had the guts to. This is why President Obama extended, yes, you heard me right, extended the sanctions W took out against Zimbabwe. That's right. Obama is carrying out the whites' orders. And he has no problem letting Zimbabwe's government leaders into the country just so long as they're leaders that the whites approve of. If the whites were really so concerned about electoral fraud and election-related violence in Africa, why haven't they said a word about Kenya? Because at the same time we saw whites working themselves into a lather because some white troublemakers said their votes didn't get counted, in Nairobi, the British-backed dictator was busy killing over a thousand of his fellow Kenyans and displacing tens of thousands more. Just so you know, even the most outrageous death tolls Mugabe has been accused of in 2008 only came to 130 at most. And that's from the opposition party, who I'm sure had no incentive to lie. All the world press talked about the real massacre going on in Kenya, the real barbarity taking place by the British hand-picked stooge in Nairobi. But for some reason the BBC didn't hear a word about it. The British government didn't go to the African Union and demand that their hand-picked puppet Kabaki be denounced, and they sure as hell didn't go to the UN either. Two disputed elections, claims of governmental violence in both cases, but one saw the death toll reach astronomical heights, while in the other case the casualties were negligible. Yet who did the whites choose to go after? See, it's never been about land or human rights. Since when have the Euro clowns ever cared about that anyway? It's always been about supporting and maintaining white power. Mugabe has shown the world that even the poorest of nations can overthrow white control if they have leaders committed to it. Every African on the planet needs to be watching this one. Mugabe, regardless of his faults, is showing us the way. And for that, we should support him.